And so when we think about this, Jesus talks about the idea that you need to become as little children in, in Luke 18. He says, in fact, unless you become as a little child, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And what does he mean by that? Well, I, I can pull the parents in the room and, and ask them, do you want your elders to act like your children? And the answer is probably going to be an emphatic, no, we don't want that at all. Because we understand that's not what Paul's talking about here. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The idea of becoming as little children. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Paul says, don't think as a child. You know, children think simplistically. They don't see things in complex ideas. They see things in very black and white and plain terms. And we see, you know, we see this in our political discourse. We more and more seem to be elevating children and younger and younger. And, and listen to how they talk about these issues. And, and wish we could see things like they do. And, and how clearly they see it. Well, they see things clearly because they see things simplistically. And we understand that when we look at the Bible, we can't simply see things without having a greater and deeper understanding of the meaning and the context and how these decisions will have a ramification on things that are far beyond what we're talking about right here. We can't be simplistic in the idea of how we look. That's, that's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? Uh, the idea in Ephesians 4.14 that we, you know, we're supposed to grow up to maturity, that we will not be tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine. You know, children are fickle. Now, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb on this. Whoever's got, if I've got mints today, then they're going to come and they're going to be excited to see me. If I'm, I'm focused on them that day, then they're going to be really happy about that. If I tell them something they don't like, they're not so popular anymore. And they're going to go find somebody that will tell them what they want to hear. That's how children react. We have to be that way. In fact, Paul talks about the fact that the sign of maturity is that we aren't like that, that we're set in our ways, that we're rooted, that we're grounded in the truth. And then we're not vacillating back and forth depending on who's got the best story for us. So he's not talking about that. He's also not talking about the idea of children in terms of the knowledge of the word. And Hebrews 6 talks about the idea that we are to be mature in the word. And he said in chapter 5, you know, at certain times you ought to be teachers of the word. We need to have an understanding, a deeper knowledge. You know, children have very superficial understandings of things. And, and they have to start at a very basic level. I can't exp you can't explain calculus to a child until you explain them um, arithmetic and, and ge um, geometry and, and uh, trigonometry and going on up and building on that foundation until you get here. That is a different level of understanding. And Jesus isn't talking about any of those things. So what does he mean? Well, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, well, Jesus loved children. Why? Well, because they're so innocent and they're, so, you know, they're sweet and they're cute and... It, it, he may have loved him for that reason, I, I don't know. But I would suggest to you that, that Jesus never uses children in the, concept, in the context of innocence, in the context of purity. That's not the point that he's trying to make. He's trying to talk about the idea of humility. And he says, if you will not humble yourself as a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? We think about the humility of a child. You know, and the best way to do this is to start as an adult. Let's just say, for example, that we're standing around and we're having a discussion. And somebody, one of the members, and probably a really big member, uh, decides to use me as an example. Says, Take Paul over here. So he kind of picks me up, throws me over his shoulder, and takes me over to a chair and sits down, puts me on his lap, and says, now Paul here, he starts talking to me as if I'm not even in the room. And he starts giving these examples. How do you think I'm going to feel about that? Am I going to be happy about that? No. I'm going to be annoyed, I'm going to be insulted, I'm going to feel like I'm being condescended, I'm not going to be happy about this at all, am I? Because I'm a grown-up, and I don't want to be treated like a child. How does a child react? We pick them up, take them where we want to go. For the most part, they like that. You know, they may, I may get some, you know, if I pick up one of the kids after church, I may get some directions on where they think we ought to go, but for the most part, they're, they're okay with that. And some of them don't even want to be put down at all. They're very much okay with the idea of you taking them where they need to be. They don't have a resistance to that. They don't see themselves in that way. They have an understanding that they are not, well, I was going to say they have an understanding that they're not in charge. That, that's debatable, I guess. But I think at the end of the day, ultimately, there's not this idea that that. that I'm so proud that I can't be picked up, that I can't be coddled, that I can't be condescended to, as you, if you want to say. You know, the idea of condescension is a negative term in the way that we think about it. In reaction, all it is is the idea of literally kneeling down, you know, talking to someone who is inferior or, or smaller or weaker or in a way that they can accept. And that's what we do to children. And it's the proper way to act to them. And they have no problem with that because they're humble 
That's the attitude that we need to have. Now, not, it, it, the idea that, do we understand why that is? If, if I see myself as a child of God, how am I going to react to Jesus telling me, this is the way that you need to live. This is where you need to go. You need to go by the one gate. Don't go by these other gates. Don't listen to these other people. Do we see why that's so important for us in terms of the way that we approach our service to God? Now, I want to make a note about something because the child in Luke 9, I would suggest, is a different analogy than what we're talking about here. And we've been talking about the idea that you need to become as little children. But if you look back in 9, in fact, let's look over at Matthew chapter, eight, uh, chapter 18. This is actually... Um, Um, look at the point that he makes. Um, he, he talks about this in verse 3. He says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fasten around his neck, and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, he's, he's now fo taking the focus off on you becoming a child, and now he's looking at, how do you see this child? How are you going to view this child? And he says, woe to the world for temptations of sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. You know, the point is that this is serious business here. You're looking at how you're going to be dealing with this child here, the, 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 the child of God, the, the young person, the one who is weak in the faith. How are you going to deal with that person when you are in charge, when you are leading the Lord's church? How do you view that person? And he goes on, and I think it's significant that Matthew groups these together. Because in verse 10 he says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven there are angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. There is a priority that God places on those who are young, those who are weak, those who are struggling, those who the world might consider not worthy. Those are the ones he says, if you want to lead in the kingdom of God, you need to be paying attention, you need to be paying attention to these. Because God loves them. And God hasn't forgotten about them, and neither should you. There's this idea in, 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 in Luke 9, when Jesus talks about the idea, he, 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 if you remember, he takes the child and places next to him, and he doesn't say you need to become like this child. He says, how do you regard this child? Such is the kingdom of heaven. Such is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, the one who is least. The idea that there is a significance that God places on these least of the members. And if you're going to lead the people of God, you need to have an understanding of that. I think that's the point that he's trying to make here. It's not only about how I perceive myself in terms of my own humility, but also how much I value those others who are, who are in my charge. It, it, we think about the idea of children. Why, why is that so important? Why is it for, for whether it be an apostle, whether it be an elder, whoever it might be, why is it such a big deal that I, I regard that person in this way? Well, you know, over in Acts chapter 20, when Paul's warning the, the, the elders at Ephesus and talks about the idea that there will be wolves coming up, some even among you, who will, who will, bring, who will lead people away after different doctrines. You know, one of the great, you know, you know, we talk about the idea of a child being humble and being willing to listen and being willing to be taught. Well, we understand that there's limits to that, is it? But, but the reality of the fact is, especially if you've got someone who is young in the faith, someone who is, uh, there's a tendency to trust. There's a tendency to be almost gullible even in the word. And the idea that a false teacher can come in and lead someone away with persuasive words, that's a, a real possibility. And we have to understand that this power that you're going to have as a leader can be very easily abused. You can, you're going to be able to use that humility to take them wherever you want to go. Now, where do you want to take them? Are you going to take them where you want to go? Or are you going to take them where God has directed, where Jesus has told you that you want them to go? That is a great responsibility. Not only as an elder, but in, but in all of our lives, in terms of how we treat those 
who are young, who are weak in the faith, who are, who are struggling in some way, are we leading them towards where God wants them to go or where I want them to go? So let me ask you this, and I'm going to run through these. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we could, we could spend a lot of time, obviously. But um, I think it's really interesting. You know, these are the same people that up until the last night of Jesus on earth are bickering about this. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? They continue to not understand this. It's interesting to see how these played out in the way that they lead. Because I think what you see when you look at the apostles, you know, obviously there's a lot of things and examples of how they led. You know, and, and the most extreme, obviously, was the idea that they led with discipline. In Acts chapter 5, you know, Peter puts Ananias and Sapphira to death. He's pretty, he's pretty strong. He's pretty straightforward here. The idea that I have the right and the authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ to inflict this punishment, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. And Paul refers to this in 1 Corinthians 5, with the idea that, you know, not having been there as because of the Spirit of God that is in me, I have placed judgment on this person already. You know, to withdraw, you need to withdraw this person, deliver him up to Satan. You know, that was in his authority, in their authority to do as apostles of Jesus Christ. And we see examples where they gave direct commands. Over in Acts chapter 10, if you remember, in fact, if you want to look over there, Acts chapter 10, remember this is the story of of Peter and going to Cornelius. And if you remember, Peter has now taken a number of the the Jews from Jerusalem or from Joppa along with him, uh, and he's met with Cornelius, and and he's been teaching them. It says in verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on him on all who heard the word. And the the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gifts of the Holy Spirit were poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, can anyone without withhold water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, Peter said, "I'm, I'm the apostle. I have the delivered word of God. This is what we're going to do. They need to be baptized into Christ, and that's exactly what happens. Uh, and Paul alludes to this idea of having the authority to command as an apostle of, God, apostle of Christ. They had that right. And they had that in every context of every, in, um, every, um, every interaction that they have within the church. They could simply end the discussion right there. I am an apostle, and you're going to do what I tell you to do. But it's interesting that that's not how it works out. And in fact, in the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 11, remember what happens in chapter 11 when Peter goes back to the Jews in in Jerusalem and explains what's going on because they had some problems with this. Now again, he could have gone right back to the, it doesn't matter what you think, I'm going to command you to do this. But that's not what he does. In fact, he instructs them. And he says at the very end, when I saw what God had done in sending his spirit, who was I to, to stand against God? He's explaining to them, this is the reason that we are doing this. It's not just because I say so. This is the commandments and the teachings and the instructions of God. And if you remember, we'll allude back to Acts 15 later on. But if you remember what happens when Peter goes back in Acts chapter 15, we have these discussions about uh, whether the Gentiles need to, to be circumcised and obey the law. You know, again, Peter and Paul were both there, and neither one of them decides to say, I'm an apostle and this is what we're going to do. What they do instead is they instruct They recount what God has done with them. They recount all the things that they have seen and what they have done and convince the people through the word of God that this is what we need to be doing. Well, it keeps going on. In fact, a lot of times, Paul doesn't even do this. He talks about them from the standpoint of encouragement. Sometimes leads not from the standpoint of commanding and say, this is what you need to do, this is what you should do, but this is what you ought to do. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you remember this, uh, this account, Uh, In in 2 Corinthians, Paul has been talking to them in this passage about the collection for the saints in uh, in Jerusalem that that they have agreed to be a part of early on, and now he's encouraging them to continue the work. And again, Paul doesn't simply say, you said you were going to do this, it's time for you to do it, you you need to be involved. Look at what he says in chapter 8, verse 7 through 8, he says, As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in all love, See that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. Do this because it's the right thing to do. Do this because it's going to be good for you. Do this because this is the kind of people that I am convinced that you are, and I know that you're going to do what you, you're going to fulfill what you have started out to do. Um, Look over at um, 1 Corinthians 7. 
Paul takes another route here. And, and this, is, this is a passage where I'm fully, I, I'm aware that a lot of people will, will go to here and say, well, I know that Paul says this is an advice, but it's really, it's really a command. But, but down in verse 25, look at what he says. Um, now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment. As one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. And he goes on and talks about this. And again, he, he's, he's giving them counsel here. He's not saying again, I'm the apostle. And I, you know what? I know what's best for you. So you just need to do what I tell you to do. Well, that's not what he's going on here. Now, there are instances where he does exactly that. But there are also times when he says, I want what's best for you. And, you know, I have background, I have insight in the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to tell you, this is how I think you should go. You know, what would we do, by the way? As an apostle, apostle of Christ gives us advice, are we going to take that? You know, I would assume that we probably would, right? Uh, but the idea was it's not necessarily about, uh, about invoking my apostleship and causing you to do what's right. It's the idea that I want what's best for you in your life. I'm going to try to guide you in that direction. I'm going to give you the best counsel I can. Ultimately, it's going to be up to you to decide. But this, is, this I think, is what's best. Well, he goes even a step further over in Acts chapter 16. Um, in fact, look over at Acts chapter 16 real quick. Acts chapter 16, um, if you remember this story, Paul uh, it comes also to Derby and to Lystra in verse 1. It says a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in their places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now we know from the book of Galatians that, that Paul didn't do this just because Timothy needed to be circumcised. And in fact, he says when Titus is in the same situation, he says, I would not, we, we, didn't, we didn't give in to them, not, not for an instance. But in this case, because he was a Jewish, a Jewish man, because he had that background, Paul accommodated the needs of people, even though it wasn't necessary, even though it shouldn't have had, he shouldn't have had to do it, but he did it anyway. And he, and, he, and he got Timothy to go along with it as well, because this is going to be what's best for the situation. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Notice what he says. He says in verse 1, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are, not my workmanship? are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, and he's going to go on and talk about what he has a right to do and what he has done and has, hasn't done in verse 19. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more of them. To the Jew, I became as Jew in order to win Jews. To those who are under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. See what Paul's priority here is. He's looking not at the idea of what his right is or what his authority is or what his, his status is as an apostle. He's looking at what do I need to do to accomplish the work that God has given me to do. And in this case, if these things are going to be a hindrance to me, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do them. I'm going to get them out of the way. I'm going to accommodate when I can accommodate. I'm going to go along when I can go along. This is not the idea of Paul taking his apostleship and using it as an excuse to do things exactly the way he wants to do every single time. How about tact? You know, the book of Philemon, we could do a study on Philemon just in itself. And we see the language that Paul uses over there when he's talking to Philemon and convincing him to, to allow Onesimus, his runaway slave, to come back not as a slave now, but as a fellow child of God. And, and Paul talks about this idea that, you know, I, Philemon, you do what's, do what's right. I have confidence that you're going to do the right thing. I'm not even going to talk to you about how the fact that you owe me your own soul. I, I'm not going to talk about all the things that I've done for you and all the things that I could order you to do as an apostle. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to appeal to you to do it because you know it's the right thing to do. I'm going to give you a chance not to obey God under compulsion, but to do it out of your own sense of love for God because that's to your glory and to, the, and to, your, to your profit and to the glory of God. It's not going to do me any good to drag you kicking and screaming to a conclusion that you haven't come to on your own. And we see Paul using this idea of tact and this idea of diplomacy 
uh, and the idea of persuasion. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, again, he uses a lot of these tactics, again, with the, the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 11 through 12. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not committing our, commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. We're, we're presenting ourselves in this way to lead you in the right direction. That's the attitude that he has in a number of examples. And we see, for that, for the, for that matter, sometimes it's not even about teaching. Sometimes it's about example. And Peter talks about this as well. He, he talks about in 1 Peter 5, as a fellow elder, shepherd the flock that is among you. You know, not as lording it over, by his, but by, his, by examples. That they will look to you and see that pattern of godliness that they're out, they ought to see. I'm going to lead not because I'm going to drag you along, but because you're going to see someone who is modeling the behavior of Jesus Christ and going to say, I want to follow this person because this person is going in the direction that I want to go. And, and Paul talks about this as well. The idea that in 2, Thess 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he talks about that even when we were with you, we did, not, you know, we, we did not eat of anyone's bread without paying for it. We worked with our own hands. We did all these things because we wanted to show you an example of what it was like to live an orderly and a godly life. It was important for him that he not only teach, not only talk, not only command, but he was going to live in exactly the way that he called others to live as well.